Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, if there were any one period in time one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution? When old and new stand side by side and admit of being compared, when the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope, and when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new era, this time, like all times, is a very good one if we know what to do with it. If we know what to do with it. She reminds me of a story that happened 17 and a half years ago for me. I lived in Sydney, Australia, and I just started a new job. And I was asked to go to a national sales meeting because I was the general manager of the operation. And I learned that the national sales meeting was actually on the date that my wife was due to have our child. So I was very concerned. I went home and told her about it. I said, look, first children are never born on their due date. <laughs> so I'm going to be gone just one night, and I'm going to Cairns, Australia, and I'm going to be there for one night for this meeting. I've got to give a speech, and I'm going to come back, and everything's going to be fine. And very likely, the doctor told us anyway that you're not going to have the baby for about two more weeks. So I went up there, and I was still negotiating the bonus plan for the year, so I was talking with my new boss, who was a Swiss gentleman named Roto. And Roto had this very, very heavy, thick Swiss accent, and he always smoked cigarettes. And we're going through this tough negotiation, and right in the middle of the negotiation, at 11.45 at night, as we sat in the bar, the phone rings. And it's my wife. And I said, is everything okay? She said, I just had my water break. And I thought, oh, no. I'm in cans. There's no way that I'm going to be able to get back down to Sydney in that amount of time, because the doctors always say it's about four hours to make it from the time the water breaks till the baby comes. So I, I went to my boss. I knew he had a plane. And I said, is there some way that you can fly me down to Sydney tonight? Because my wife's just gone into labor. And he said, uh, well, he smoked a cigarette. Give me 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll prepare a flight plan, and we will go. So I run back to my room, I take everything off my bed, I throw it in the suitcase. I remember I still have the remote control that actually went flying into my suitcase. And I ran downstairs, I'm standing by the elevator waiting for him, and about 20 minutes later he finally leisurely walks out of the elevator and he looks at me and he says, can you believe I lost the key to my airplane? <laughs> so we run, literally run, we get in a taxi, we go to the airport and I learned then that you know, the airport lights, this is at Port Douglas, turn on when you actually have a little radio button inside the plane. So you hit the button and all the lights turn on and he says, okay, I need you to check the wing, I need you to check the oil, I need you to check the condensation. I'm like, I don't know anything about this stuff. Are you kidding me? So I was really afraid. <laughs> and when, and well, the people that work with me know that when I get afraid or stressed, my heart rate really drops my blood pressure drops. I kind of have an opposite effect. And at all my companies, my management teams know this, and so when things get really rough and tough, because I kind of lead turnarounds, they usually buy me a pillow because I fall asleep. <laughs> so we get in the plane, we take off, and I'm thinking, I gotta make it to the berth, I gotta make it to the berth, I gotta make it to the berth. And I completely fall asleep. <laughs> and I'm in the cockpit, I'm the co-pilot. So we're up in the sky, all of a sudden we're bouncing around, I wake up and I look at the dashboard and where everything had been well lit before, now it's completely black. And he says to me, Robert, can you see the coastline? And I said, no, there's too many clouds. And he says, he's talking in this thing, it's really loud, it's a prop plane, it's a piper chief. And he says, are you sure you cannot see the coastline? And I said, yeah. And he says, to add to the drama of the situation, <laughs> all of our navigation and instrumentation is inoperative. Can you see the coastline? <laughs> so they actually have to close down Sydney International Airport to find us. We had flown off course towards New Zealand. That's why he's asking about the coastline. We only had enough fuel to make it to Sydney, and now it was really, 
I got to make it to my, birth, my daughter's birth. I got to make it to my daughter's birth. And now I'm thinking, I just got to make it. <laughs> so finally, we come into Sydney and we land the plane. I rush to the hospital. We land at 3.07, and it takes 30 minutes to get to Balcom Hills Hospital, and I'm going as fast as I can. I make it there. I rush through the labor ward doors, and just as I run into the room where my wife was having our daughter, the doctor says, he made it. The nurse says, he made it. And I see my daughter's head just barely crowning, and one minute later, she was born. Now, of course, I got to hold her at that moment, and it was the most awe-inspiring moment of my entire life. And I remember thinking, this time is a very good one, but my thoughts are searched by fear and by hope. Will I be a great father? And those of us that have had children know this feeling. Will I be able to take on this responsibility? Will she be the daughter that I aspire her to be? Will I be that father to her as well? You know, very often we all get caught in moments of fear. And Alexander the Great once said, man's immortality is not living forever. Every moment free from fear makes man immortal. Man's immortality is not living forever because that desire is born of fear. Every moment free from fear makes man immortal. When you break yourself of fear, your thoughts go on forever. But how do you do it? Because all of us start to think in terms of scarcity. Some of us actually make it to terms of abundance. You know, Harvard Business School asked their students when they were graduating, what would you rather have when you graduate for a salary? Scenario A, and all dollars are constant. Scenario A is you make $160,000 upon graduation, and the rest of the students in the cohort, on average, get 150. Scenario B is you make $200,000, and the rest of the students, on average, get 220. What do you think they chose? 87% chose A. Now, you would think these are some of the smartest kids in the world, right? You would think that they're brilliant, they're going to Harvard Business School, they learned about money, and yet they chose the lesser economics because they're more focused on having versus having not. They're more focused in terms of your win is my loss and vice versa, when actually abundance changes everything. Abundance comes from a place of confidence. Scarcity comes from a place of fear. Breaking yourself of that type of thinking will change your life and change your world. In life, we don't get what we deserve all the time. We get what we expect. Researchers went to a first grade class, first grade class and they tested all the students to do an IQ test. And in that IQ test, they asked everybody, and they told the teacher, you're not allowed to talk to the students about this, you're not allowed to tell the parents, We're going to observe you for a full year, and you have to sign a contract of confidentiality on who gets the highest scores. Of the 30 students tested, five got genius level, more than 140 IQ scores. Five students. So for the course of the next year, they monitored the class. They monitored the teacher. And at the end of the year, they came back and tested all the students to see if there were any variations or differences in the outcomes. Who do you think got the five highest scores? The five genius students. No great surprise, except that that wasn't the true nature and subject of the research. The true subject of the research was that they lied to the teacher. None of the students the year before had actually been tested as gifted. Her expectation that those five students at a subconscious level, and she really did follow the rules, led those five students to get the highest scores. Two ways to overcome fear, and these are from my personal experience in life, so this is not anything more than just philosophy of Robert. One is gratitude. I've found it impossible to be fearful and grateful at the same time. 
If I let my mind stop for a moment and feel gratitude, even in moments of despair and difficulty, it makes all the difference in my life. The next way to overcome fear that I've found personally is to be intentional in my decisions. Everything that happens to you in your life can either be the best thing that ever happened to you or it could be the worst. It's about your perception of that. About 18 months ago, I had a terrible, humiliating experience in my life. I had left a wonderful job two years before, and I left because I was recruited by Warburg Pincus, a very large private equity fund, to become CEO of Bausch & Lomb Surgical. And the intent was to spin out that business and to take that as a separate business and really try to drive value from it. And it was a dog of a business at the time. It wasn't performing very well at all. During the course of the next year, we changed the metrics of the business. It succeeded. It did really well. After a year and a half, I was ready. Okay, the company's doing great. Our employee willingness to recommend scores are really high. All of our scores across customer willingness to recommend are really high. It's time. Well, because we started doing so well and forecasted great growth, the parent decided they weren't going to spin off the business and that they could derive greater value by selling it to one party, the entire company. My hopes were dashed. I was broken. That night, I flew home from New York City, very broken. I actually threw up on the airplane. And the next morning, I woke up, and I remember thinking, today can be the worst day of my life or it can be the best. It's up to me. I decided it was going to be the best. Later that day, I had an idea to create the first Medicare opt-out company in all of healthcare. The first company that takes no money from the government. I didn't realize how big of an idea that could be. It's a year and a half later, and Friday, just yesterday, I toured the Bausch & Lomb building. Bausch & Lomb was just bought by Valiant for $9 billion. I toured the Bausch & Lomb building and made a bid on the property in 18 months. What can your mind do in 18 months if you free yourself from fear? Nelson Mandela spent 29 years in prison as a political prisoner, having done nothing wrong except express his ideology and philosophy. Every day while they made him chip stone, he remembered one poem by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet, the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Each of us is the master of our own fates. We can overcome fear with gratitude. We can overcome fear with intentional choice. And our perception drives reality. In life, you don't get what you deserve always, but you almost always get what you expect. That moment where I held my daughter, I decided 17 and a half years ago that every day I would tell her I loved her, that she would be a beautiful woman, that she'd be the best daughter I could ever imagine. Her name's Madeline. And that she would be smart and sophisticated and polite and kind, and grounded, she's become exactly that. Life happens to us every day. We can decide what we will do with it. Let's all decide that we are the masters of our fate, that we are the captains of our own souls. Thank you.